thank you everyone for coming. On behalf of my brother, my sisters, my mother, my father's sisters, an extended family, I want to thank you for being here. I've been asked to speak on behalf of all of them today in remembrance of a man we love. What a task to speak at that man's remembrance. What stories should I tell? I thought maybe I would tell the story of a self-made man, a man who rose himself up from those bootstraps. It's an inspiring story, it is a story that I love. <clears throat> but it's not really the story I want to tell. And I thought maybe I would tell just a few small stories about some of his really true great successes, courtroom victories, business successes, <laughs> that everybody's already heard. Because I love those stories. I love them as a boy. Not the stories I want to tell. And I thought I'd maybe talk about the times in life that he failed never gave up. Because they inspired me most. But none of those stories really speak to the heart of who he was. None of those stories speak to what motivated him to be all of those things. So, I want to tell this one story about when I was a little boy. And I might get a little emotional. Uh, my dad was busy a lot worked a lot. And the one thing that we did as a family to make sure that we spent time together was we would go skiing. Some of you maybe went skiing with him a time or two. And we would be in the car for hours and we'd drive out to Mount Hood or Mount Bachelor most of them. And we would ride the sheriff together and he would tell me stories and lecture. And as a young boy he taught me how to ski. And then he would go ski with his friends and other lawyers on the, the more adult, advanced courses for the men, which I desperately wanted to be. I wanted to join them. And there was a chair. They were bad. Uh, in Mount Bachelor, the chairs, you have to understand, were color-coded. The yellow chair was the easiest. It was for the little kids. And then there was an orange chair and a red chair and a blue chair. And if you really knew your stuff, you could go on the black chair. And my father would go on the black chair. And I was very young, and I would say, please, I'm ready. And I wanted to go on the black chair. And finally, one day, everyone had gone into the lodge. It was incredibly cold. And he said, OK, I'll take you on the black chair. And in those days, the chairs were all run by diesel engines. And if somebody fell getting on the chair, the chair would stop. And that diesel engine would get cold, and sometimes those chairs wouldn't start up again for a while, and you'd sit there and get really, really cold. Why am I talking about a chair? And I, I remember, who cares? I wanted to ride that chair with my father. We got on the chair, the black chair. And I hold on to this pole, and I was maybe six years old. And I hold on to this pole with dear life. This was before they had safety guards and all these other things to keep us safe. And we go, going up, and the chair stops. It stops because it's cold, it stops because somebody had fallen. And I start to get a little bit cold, but I'm okay. But the chair doesn't start up again. 
and we're sitting there for a while, and I'm starting to get a little cold. And I don't remember why, I wish I did, but I had to take my gloves off for some reason. I don't know why, I just did. I had to take them off and get some chapstick. And I took these gloves off my hands, and I tucked them carefully under my left leg. I held them there, and I did whatever I needed to do. And I went to put my gloves back on. I remember I put my, pulled my right hand, I pulled that left glove out, and I put it on around the pole. My hands were getting very cold, and I tried to put the right, <clears throat> right glove on, but I didn't want to let go of that left pole. And so I reached in, and I almost had it on. And I dropped my glove. And it bounced off the front of the chair, and I watched it fall. It's like a scene in a movie when time slows down. I could see it just fall right through my skis. I, you know, I tried to cross when I catch it, but it was our I saw it fall, I saw it plummet in the snow, and I was scared. Because it was cold, the chair was on. So cold. My father, he just took a glove. He took his glove off, put it on my hand. And I remember two things. It was so big. His hand was so big. It was enormous, this man's hand. My mind was so big. But it was as hot as the sun. It was so hot. And I instantly felt relieved. And I felt a little bit guilty. Because the chair was still not moving. And I knew my father's hand was getting cold. We were there for quite some time. I said, Dad, thank you. It isn't your hand getting cold. And he said, don't worry about my hand. I can raise the body, the temperature of my own body, using nothing but the power of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't show up. We sat on that chair. I was freezing for 15 minutes. He could have tucked his hand in his sleeve, but he left it out there to show me. And the point of this is I know his hand was cold. I know he was cold. But he would have let his hand freeze off for me before he let me go. And the reason is, because he had love in his heart. And that is what motivated my father. That is what caused him to accomplish so many things, was his love for me, my brother, my siblings, my mother, his sisters, his family, so many of you that are here today. And so, if I could tell you one story, one thing about him, I'd tell you that one. Because I think it speaks to who he truly was as a man. He was someone who loved with an enormous heart, warm as the sun. And as a son, I don't think you could ask him for anything. I want to thank you all for coming. It's going to be a reception afterwards, and I hope you all can tell me a story. Maybe like the one I just told you. Thank you.